I believe that many industries are trying to solve for what does it look like to live in this new hybrid environment and figure out how to connect in person and remote, which may sound like, you know, yes, that happened over COVID, but I don't think anyone's really figured out a disruptive way to streamline that and make it meaningful as people start to return to work and understand what that landscape's going to look like. Good question. So, I mean, two things come to mind. One of them, um, which I'm sure many other people have said is just around the whole remote working space. Like we now need better tools. We need better ways to collaborate with each other from video to diagramming to you know, writing documents and software together and pair programming. And hey, even if you extrapolate out to metaverse level things of, of what is the remote environment of the future in which we'll all be part of, um, there's a huge growth space there. And uh, there's a lot of work to do in order to be able to replace all the things that we're used to in the office and make it a compelling experience. And in terms of the pure technical thing away from remote work, like I'm super interested in, in WebAssembly as a sort of portable compilation target. Um, that enables, you know, way more stuff to run in the browser, both on the server and at the edge. So that's just cool in general. And I have like a compiler background, so I, I keep a watch on that because it's just interesting to me. I, I think that it's going to come from uh, legal and regulatory places uh, more than from like a, a technical innovation. Um, we're seeing a lot more of uh, distrust in the world um, and a lot more of concern around data residency and who has access to my data and who doesn't and where's my personal information being stored. And, and while this, this began, you know, a long time ago, we had HIPAA, we had GDPR, we had all these things. Um, it's getting more and more um, restrictive and more and more prescriptive about what do companies expect from, you know, their, their infrastructure providers or their software providers in terms of their ability to trust the product that we're offering them. And so I think this will push us very strongly towards a lot more self-healing systems, um, a, a lot more of how do we how do we have transparency with the operations that go on in a given system? Um, how do we give customers more control of what happens to their data? And I think that's gonna we're gonna have to come up with some pretty clever solutions to those problems in order to continue to, you know, build software. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping we can fight off uh, regulation. I think I think part of that, and, and part of what we're starting to see uh, picked up in large enterprise companies, is the the adoption of continuous verification. So, um, you know, continuous integration allowed us to build features faster. That's like building a faster engine um, because it it by combining code, it limits the rate at which bugs are created. Uh, continuous delivery allowed us to to get those features in front of customers faster. So that's like you know, stepping on the, the pedal of a car uh, harder, accelerating. Uh, so that allowed us to move faster than prior to, to, to the CI, CD adoption. And now kind of the third and final piece of that evolution is like, okay, how do we move fast without breaking things? And so CV is, is you know, how do we bring that same expertise and automation over to business outcomes so that um, uh, the business can focus on what it cares about, which uh, for better or worse, is not architecture uh, and it's not software. It's yes, move fast, but also don't break things. W you know, we need we need these <clears throat> business outcomes to to be uh, automatically maintained. Um, so, getting a really strong signal on that, I think, is is the next thing that's going to uh, fundamentally change how we think about building large software systems at scale. Ah, so the answer is going to be a bit biased here. I would say machine learning. Uh, as you know, machine learning is can be used uh, to solve many, many problems and across many business sectors and possibly improving our lives in the future. And we start to see some meaningful results in this area, area like you know, machine medicine, like how ML is, help, is used to help with diagnosing medical diseases. Uh, and the other one is about autonomous self-driving car. It's still making progress, but it's an area that would be really excited in the future. And the last part that I'm really hopeful about is how machine learning can help with climate change, dealing with climate changes. Okay? There's a lot of work being done out there and I'm excited to see about that. I, 
I work in, with data and I see how far we are of having uh, tools that really allow us to, to use um, data and do data-driven uh, applications in our day-to-day -day, uh, life as, as developers. So I think in the next years, we are going to see uh, more and more tools that are going to help us to really do data-driven applications. Right now, uh, everything is... Uh, uh, it, it's so difficult, uh, it's very fragmented, the billing is, is hard and everything is, is uh, kind of complicated to, to really uh, use the, the power of data that was promised uh, several years ago. So I think the, the next disruption will happen when uh, we have the, the tools and uh, the, the frameworks that are going to allow us to really do data-driven applications the way that I think uh, they should be done. Oh, <laughs> I mean, so yes, the re reimagining of the front end and back end contract, I think, is going to be a big deal. But something I'm actually personally very interested in for developer productivity is essentially the cloudification of the inner developer inner loop. So essentially, the blog post that I just wrote recently, which uh, got a lot of uh, attention, was the end of local hosts. Like, why are we? Uh, treating our dev environment as local host as like a special thing. And then we deploy that dev environment to the cloud and then start debugging between dev and cloud. Why don't we just start in cloud? Uh, and that's the, I think that's probably going to be pretty disruptive for developers because it means that we no longer uh, treat our local dev environment as a precious pet. Uh, we just spin up a, a spare environment anytime we need to work on something uh, by forking the production environment. So I'm I'm looking at how um, our level of abstraction as software engineers keeps evolving. That we used to have to solve low level, like sending data over the wire and defining the packets, and then we had frameworks that helped us with that. And we keep getting further and further away from the metal in some cases, but it allows us to think closer to the the business problem. I'm looking to see how AI is going to show up and change that. And so maybe some of the work that was always solved in a low level framework before um, is now automatically generated by an AI. Maybe that's something like GitHub Copilot, where I start typing my question and it gives me the answer of here's some common code that you don't have to write. Because um, those are the things that I shouldn't be spending a lot of time on. I want to spend the time solving my business problems. So I think that's going to be really interesting to see how that evolves in the next three to five years.